In early 2001, FEMA identified three disasters likely to hit the United States. One was a terrorist attack on New York City. It happened. Another was a hurricane that floods New Orleans. It happened. The third disaster was a catastrophic earthquake that levels the San Francisco Bay Area. It hasn't happened yet. There's no question a big earthquake will strike San Francisco. When? Uh, we don't know. Soon enough. When it does, it will strike without warning. We don't have any way to predict earthquakes. Seven million people will be caught in the seismic crosshairs. Several thousand deaths. That's probably what we're looking at in the Bay Area. Thousands of buildings demolished. Bridges collapsing. Fire raging through the streets. It could happen any day now. Even tomorrow. San Francisco. The only thing that isn't laid back about this place is its geography. 750,000 people enjoy a city of rich culture that has captured their hearts. San Francisco is a great city. Everything is accepted here, basically. What do I love about San Francisco? The diversity. I love everything about San Francisco. The weather, the people, North Beach, the food. But as much as they love living here, they also live with a hard fact that the ground under them could one day rupture in a massive earthquake and destroy their city without warning. Without a doubt, will probably be the largest disaster this country has faced, um, even compared to the major hurricanes that we've had. But this city of hills and trolley cars has experienced such a catastrophe once before, a hundred years ago, in 1906. 1906. The first mass-produced automobiles are making their way onto San Francisco's Market Street. San Francisco is the largest city on the West Coast, with a population of 400,000. It's a sophisticated city with a wild side that includes saloons and opium dens. San Francisco was really part Paris and part Dodge City. It was an extraordinary place, very wonderful and very wicked simultaneously. But while people in this extraordinary place know their city is vulnerable to earthquakes, few even imagine how dangerous these quakes can be. The average citizen of San Francisco walking down Market Street would have had no idea that this magnificent city would be erased from the earth in a very short period of time. That time comes at 5.12 a.m. on April 18th, 1906. Survivor accounts tell a grisly tale. At 5.10 a.m. by the station clock, I was seated at the desk in the office when I felt a slight trembling of the great building. Then the seemingly light tremor began to increase in violence. Huge stones and lumps of masonry came crashing down and expecting every moment to be buried under a mass of ruins. I shouted, get out! The earthquake unloads with a destructive force of 400 Hiroshima atomic bombs. To police officer Jesse Cook, walking the beat, it feels like the end of the world. I heard the rumble like the roar of the sea and the earth seemed to rise under me. The buildings around me began to tumble and fall and I saw the top story of the building at the southwest corner of Washington and Davis streets fall and kill two men. They were both buried under at least two tons of brick. Two miles southwest, Lieutenant Henry Powell runs for his life as the Valencia Hotel threatens to collapse. As we ran, we heard the hotel creak, roar, and crash. I turned to look at it. The hotel lurched forward and crumpled down over Valencia Street. Later, a second or two later, one realized that the crumpled four-story building was full of living people. The staggering estimated 7.9 magnitude earthquake thrashes the city for almost a minute. When it finally stops, those who aren't dead or maimed pick themselves up. They watch the sunrise on a city that will never be the same. People staggered into the streets. Most people were in a state of shock. They weren't hysterical, they weren't crying, they weren't screaming. The only screams you heard were from people who were trapped. But as people rescue those trapped, they're unaware the quake has sown the seeds for even more devastation. The real horror actually began when the earthquake ended. The quake shattered the city's gas lines, needing only a spark to ignite a fire. You had gas, 
and you had shorted electricity conduits. It was a perfect recipe for a disaster. Within minutes, over 50 fires break out across the city. Firemen race to keep up with the blazes, but when they connect their hoses to hydrants, nothing comes out. The quake destroyed the city's water main system. The smaller fires grow and soon merge into a giant inferno. People watch in disbelief as a flaming apocalypse devours downtown. The fires spread throughout the night and into a second day of flaming hell. By the third day, the fires threatened to leap the city's widest street, Van Ness Avenue. The street is so wide that it will be difficult for the fire to cross, but if it does, it will consume the rest of the city until it reaches the Pacific Ocean. Van Ness Avenue is where the city must make its last stand. This is Van Ness Avenue. This 125-foot wide street here was a natural fire break, and the United States Navy pumped salt water up this street to steam engines operated by the San Francisco Fire Department Every available firefighter and sailor stares down a wall of flaming death. Even citizens join the battle. People came out of their houses and soaked towels and blankets and bed sheets in water and beat out the flames. But despite the heroic effort, the inferno begins to leap parts of the street. It looks like all is lost. Then, the firefighters get their only break of the entire ordeal. The wind began changing direction. Breezes from the west were coming in and pushing the fire back against what had already burned. The inferno has nothing left to fuel it among the charred remains. It dies a smoldering death, and the rest of the city is saved. The three days of fiery hell caused by the great 1906 earthquake are finally over. It was the biggest urban fire in American history. 28,000 buildings destroyed. 500 city blocks incinerated. The combined quake and fire leave at least 3,000 people dead and half the city homeless. 100,000 people lived in tents. Every park in the city became a tent city. But San Franciscans are eager to resume life as they once knew it. The city is so eager to rebuild that it clears the remains of the disaster without regard for the human remains it contains. The people who worked to clear the rubble saw bones in the rubble. The remains of these thousands that were killed were just unceremoniously dumped in landfill or other places. Much of the landfill is used to expand what is now the upscale Marina District. Many of the people in San Francisco today who are fretting about the next earthquake are living on the rubble of the last big earthquake. But the earthquake did more than create rubble. It created the birth of modern earthquake science. It mobilized scientists throughout California. Scientists discovered the quake was caused by a rupture of the San Andreas Fault and mapped the fault for the first time. They're shocked to discover it runs for an astounding 800 miles. Now, you know, we can fly from Los Angeles to San Francisco and follow the fault. Well, they didn't have that luxury. They sent some poor guy on a horse to follow the fault all the way to Southern California. They also map another fault line, known as the Hayward Fault, and uncover a network of six other lethal breaks in the Earth's crust. They realize many of the Bay Area's biggest cities are held in a seismic death grip. It's probably not the best place to build a major urban area, but that same geology is what creates the land that we live in and the beauty that we've got here. Today, those fault lines still cradle the Bay Area, which means a similarly devastating earthquake could happen any day, but this time, it will be even more deadly. A repeat of the 1906 earthquake is gonna be much worse for the Bay Area because of the tremendous increase in population. Today, the combined Bay Area population, including San Francisco, Oakland, and San Jose, is already 7 million, 10 times more people than in 1906. And worse, the massive population relies on vulnerable structures that could kill them by the thousands. The big differences are things that never could have existed in 06. All the infrastructure, uh, the bridges, the tunnels. 
The best example of what a giant quake could do to the modern day Bay Area happened on October 17, 1989, when the Loma Prieta earthquake struck. The 6.9 magnitude quake destroyed the upper deck of the Bay Bridge, collapsed Oakland Cypress Freeway, and sent San Francisco's Marina District on fire. But what's chilling is that the 1906 earthquake was many times stronger than this Loma Prieta quake. To create the 1906 earthquake, you'd need 30 Loma Prieta earthquakes occurring all at once together. Today, the USGS estimates there's a 62% chance of a Bay Area earthquake of 6.7 magnitude or greater. And they estimate this big one could strike any time between the next three minutes and the next 30 years. Next, what would happen if a 1906 strength quake hit the Bay Area today? The one thing that we do know is that it will be very, very bad. When it could happen tomorrow returns. Millions of people going about their daily lives. But for many, the shadow of what could happen intrudes on their thoughts. I think about the possibility of an earthquake often when riding on art. Sometimes they have instances where the lights will go out and you're in total darkness and you kind of wonder if this is the time. If an 8.0 earthquake similar to 1906 hit right now while we were driving across this bridge, let's just say I'm glad that my life insurance is paid up. When a massive quake hits the Bay Area, it will be caused by shifting tectonic plates under the Earth's surface. The two plates that are really creating the problem in California meet up along the San Andreas Fault. The Pacific Plate grinds against the North American Plate as both plates move about two inches a year in opposite directions. The problem is the plates get locked together. Even though they're stuck, they keep pushing. And ultimately, enough strain energy is built up and one of the faults is going to break and it will go just like that. A sunny Friday afternoon. Without warning, 300 miles of the San Andreas Fault rupture. The force rocks the Bay Area with a devastating 7.8 magnitude earthquake. A quake this strong has never hit San Francisco skyscrapers before. Office workers high on the top floors hope their buildings survive. You go back and forth, you can feel the building sway, you can see what's happening outside the windows. Some of those windows shatter, raining deadly shards of glass on pedestrians below. Modern office buildings are built to rigid earthquake codes. However, most residences are not, and they collapse on a massive scale. They are vulnerable because they have weak ground floors, which are supported by stilts rather than solid walls. If you have residential units in the first floor, that building collapses, those people are going to die. Even the best designed buildings risk collapse if they're built on landfill, which turns to liquid in an earthquake. When the ground starts to shake, something takes place called liquefaction and turns the landfill and sand into goo, like quicksand. But not everyone is inside a building. Many are in cars. For those on the road, the tremors also create chaos as the bridge buckles, rolls, and flexes. Your car may have trouble staying in the lane if you're driving across a major structure, especially a long-span flexible bridge. Because the Golden Gate Bridge can flex with the shaking, it survives the quake. But a few miles to the east, on the Bay Bridge, things are far worse. The Bay Bridge is probably the most fragile, dangerous structure in the state of California. Sections of the upper deck collapse, crushing cars on the lower deck. Then parts of the lower deck break open. Cars free fall for a terrifying 190 feet before plunging into the San Francisco Bay. And deep below those chilly waters, thousands of commuters are trapped on BART trains in the Trans Bay Tube. As the shaking continues, power goes out and the electric trains grind to a halt. Thousands of trapped passengers wonder what will happen next. There are several scenarios. Um, does that tube flood? If the tube floods, as many as 3,000 people could drown as it fills with cold seawater 100 feet under the bay. The shaking finally stops after nearly a minute. 
Now, the earthquake is about to deliver its knockout punch. Earthquakes rupture gas lines. Earthquakes destroy fire systems. Fire following an earthquake is a tremendous threat to any population. And the entire city of San Francisco is one giant fire hazard. It's a densely populated town built on hills, wood frame buildings built side by side. Minutes after the quake, dozens of fires break out across the city. And as usual, there are only 350 firefighters on duty at that moment. The fires are also spurred on by a local weather pattern. We have this wind machine that turns on every spring, and by the end of the summer, it's a very dry place, and now wind just blows. The wind gives infernos the power to leap city blocks at will. The flames overwhelm firefighters before reinforcements can arrive. And by the end of the day, the skyline is eerily reminiscent of a disaster that took place a hundred years ago. The images that came out of 1906, the potential for that happening again, you put together the wrong factors at the right time, the potential for a firestorm to ensue is high. When the fires are finally over, San Francisco is in ruins. The combined quake and fire destroy one third of the city's buildings. Total damage is almost $19 billion, and that's just for San Francisco. Oakland, San Jose, and other communities in the Bay Area are equally devastated. The estimated number of people dead in the region, 5,000. Now, the challenge is to take care of the living, but relief may not be able to get through. Freeway systems are wrecked. Cargo planes can't land because airport runways were built on landfill, which liquefied during the quake. Shipping docks are also built on landfill, and now the ships have nowhere to unload. Chaos erupts as desperate survivors begin looting and fighting for the supplies they need to live. It would take days probably to restore order if we got into a situation where society just broke down. Martial law would have to be imposed. Next, the quake is coming. Can anything be done to protect the city? When it could happen tomorrow continues. Engineers hope the quake will happen later rather than sooner. We're competing against time as we upgrade all our infrastructure. If key infrastructure like bridges, tunnels, and buildings can be retrofitted or strengthened to withstand an earthquake, thousands of lives will be saved. And now engineers are racing a ticking seismic clock to retrofit structures before the quake hits. Although the Golden Gate Bridge wasn't designed to modern seismic standards when it was built in the 1930s, its main span is flexible enough to roll with a quake's punch. At mid-span between the two towers, the bridge can go up six feet, down 10 feet, and sideways over 20 feet. But other parts aren't as flexible, like the approaches and ramps. To withstand a massive earthquake, they must be strengthened. Retrofit workers do their job on a suspended corrugated metal platform 200 feet in the air. From this shaky perch, they make the bridge's arch rock solid. In an earthquake, these columns were very vulnerable, so we've added these new X's and these horizontal struts to strengthen those so in an earthquake, they'll perform well. When the entire retrofit program is complete in about four years, the Golden Gate Bridge will look the same as it always has, but finally, it will have the seismic brawn to match its stunning beauty. Meanwhile, the eastern span of the Bay Bridge is so vulnerable that it's being replaced, not just retrofitted. However, the new span won't be ready for at least a decade. And the retrofits of the Trans Bay Tube aren't expected to be completed until 2012. Between now and when these structures get retrofit, they're vulnerable. Next, preparing structures for the next quake is one thing. Preparing people is another. People burn out on that message. They don't listen after a while. When the big one hits, will people be ready? It will come down to the citizens. Uh, the government can't save you. When it could happen tomorrow continues. If a massive quake struck right now. I have some fig newtons and some tuna. That's about it. And a gallon of water. <laughs> I think I'm really pretty well prepared after the devastation from Hurricane Katrina. Um, I'm really not all that prepared. You know, I've got a bottle of water, some canned food, and some toilet paper. That's about all I'm ready for. 
Today, Bay Area emergency planners urge people to prepare for disaster by having enough supplies to be self-sufficient for at least 72 hours. You need to be able to stand on your own. There is not going to be somebody that comes around the corner the day after the earthquake to give you enough food and water to survive. But as more Bay Area residents learn about the history of the 1906 quake, they may find new motivation to prepare for the coming disaster. Preparation is not doom and gloom. Preparation is community. Preparation is human beings taking responsibilities for their lives. And if we don't take that responsibility, we will pay a terrible price. Perhaps the lessons learned from the last great quake will help save lives during the next one. Because another great San Francisco earthquake could happen again. It could even happen tomorrow.